Hi, my name is Mike, and I'm one of the pastors here at Kings Harbor. Thank you so much for joining us for this online message. Here's our hope that as you hear the word of God preached, that you would see Jesus more clearly and love him more deeply. And so over the next few moments, take notes, focus, and hear how the word of God is going to transform you. Uh, if you have your Bible, we're gonna ultimately be in Nehemiah chapter eight, but it's gonna take us a little bit to get there. So like, if you got one of those, if you got a physical Bible that's got those cool ribbons, um, and if you're like the hardcore person that's got like multiple ribbons because you just wanna prove how spiritual you are, um, put one at Nehemiah eight, we'll get there in a moment. Um, as we move to that, I, I can remember when I was in middle school, and so as I was thinking about our middle schoolers walking out, I can remember that when I was in middle school and high school, we had um, in our youth group uh, a discipleship program called FIRE. Um, and which is just very Pentecostal of us, right? Like, let's just, just call it fire, right? And so we, like, with the whole discipleship program was this uh, six to eight week program. I don't remember if it was six or eight weeks, um, but you were just, it was intense discipleship. You were not watching TV. You were fasting. You were reading certain books, like multiple books. You were praying multiple hours a day. You were not listening to secular music. Uh, if you were dating, you didn't date, which I was gonna just go ahead and put myself out there. I was nerdy back then. I'm nerdy now, but I can cover it up. But like, like I was nerdy back then. So the dating one is really easy for me because I had a sanctified reason to be lonely. And so it was awesome, right? Like, so I, so we went through that and it was this six to eight week intense discipleship. At the end, we were like, we got discipled. We'd read some books, learned some information, done some things that we didn't normally do. But the reality of it was we were, we were pretty much the same. If you were dating somebody, you just stopped dating them on the DL during, during fire and like just went back to publicly doing that. Like, like you just kind of went back to your old life. And I'm sure there were some long-term effects from doing that. But the reality is that we learned some things, did some things, called it discipleship, but I'm not really sure that we were discipled. And the reason that I bring that up is that we have been on this journey, uh, so like trying to redeem joy. And so even last week, we spent a lot of time recognizing that there's a joy that comes for us because of the resurrection of Jesus. And so let me even recap that definition of joy, because I think it's important for us to get our arms around that. And so here's what the definition says. Joy is a sense or state of gladness or elation that people experience through their relationship with God and through good things in their lives. In the Old Testament, this is closely related to victory over one's enemies. In the New Testament, the sense of victory is connected to salvation. And so we talked about, and even hearing last week, maybe what, what resonated for you is because of the resurrection, because of what Jesus has done on my behalf, that there's this source of joy that's available to me. And I made a statement during the sermon that when you're dealing with pain, when you're dealing with struggle, that that's part of sanctification. And that means the work that God is doing to make you look more like Jesus. But I also said that there's this reality of discipleship, which is the work that you are doing to look more like Jesus. And so last week, I spent a lot of time explaining how joy fuels your sanctification, but I didn't do anything to answer how joy fuels your discipleship. And so this morning, I just wanna talk about how joy fuels discipleship. And so here's our main idea. Discipleship is not just learning skills or achieving results. Discipleship is centered on being with Jesus. This is where the joy is. Let's pray together. Father, I, I long for us as a people to know the joy of following Jesus, to know the fullness of what it is to, to walk with him and walk as he walked and not just from an intellectual idea or even just, a, just practices, but actually being with him. And so Lord, I pray today that as we, uh, as we continue to discover and develop joy, that we would see the beauty of, of, of how joy helps to fuel that endeavor. And so Lord, I'm trusting for you, that, you for that. So your name I pray, amen. amen. Let me say this also to you really quickly. If you are a Kings Harbor app user, uh, go to the notes section of the app and then that'll help you follow along. Um, there's actually some things even in that that you won't see here uh, that you can use for later study, like some videos, some resources, that type of deal. And so jump into that. If you don't, you can download the app really quickly and you can do that as well. And so as we jump in, last week, we spent a lot of time building a, a definition for joy. This week, I actually don't wanna spend a lot of time building a definition of discipleship. I actually just wanna illustrate it for you. Because I think in the Western church, what we've done is we've made discipleship about what you learn, what you know. In fact, oftentimes, if you ask somebody, what is the definition of a disciple? Their quick, easy answer is it's a student, it's a learner. And that's not incorrect. 
I just think the way that we think about being a student and the way that we think about learning is a little bit more narrow than the way that the scriptures talk about it. So for instance, Mark chapter three, starting in verse 13, Jesus is calling the 12 disciples to himself. And here's what it says. Jesus went up to the mountain and summoned those he wanted and they came to him. He appointed 12 whom he also named apostles. And here's what he appointed them for, to be with him and to send them out to preach and to have the authority to drive out demons. And so, so here what's going on, like Jesus is doing something that actually isn't customary for the day. Uh, and so Jesus is often seen as a rabbi, but here's where Jesus is different than a rabbi. A rabbi didn't select his students. The students selected the rabbi. It's the same way that if you were decided, hey, I want to grow in a skill uh, or I want to grow in my fitness or I want to grow something that you could Google search, find somebody. And if you had the right means and the right access, you could have that person be the person that develops you in that. This is actually not what's happening with the 12. They didn't come up to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, we think that you are spiritual and have a connection to God that most people don't have. Will you train us? Will you teach us? He actually found them and said, I'm calling you to be with me. And then the language here is not only that he's calling them to be disciples, learners, students, but he's also calling them to be followers and be those that are sent. That's what apostles mean. And then it says for two primary reasons, to be with him, and to be sent by him. Amen. Now, I don't want to miss that because I think we get to the, the to be sent by him. In fact, even when I was studying for this this week, a lot of the definitions of disciple are to learn from Jesus and then to go do what the mission that he sent you to be on. But I think a lot of times what we miss is the importance of being with him. Amen. Like the reality that he would say, hey, here's part of the discipleship process that you get to spend time with me. Like Jesus could have very easily from a distance taught some things, not had any, not had any personal interaction with them, but this reality that he wanted them to be with him and that Mark writes it intentionally that to be with him preceded doing something for him. And then the call to preach, to proclaim, to publicly announce the kingdom of God through the work and person of Jesus and then the authority to drive out demons. Like we're getting called into some stuff. And so that's interesting And then when you read Luke chapter 10, we see this happening, but hear how the conversation goes. Luke 10, 17 would say this. The 72 returned with joy. Don't miss the joy that's in that sentence. Saying, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. So hear that. They're saying, Jesus, we did the thing. And like we did the one that most people don't do. Right, like, like I get to preach, but I, like I haven't ever walked in and be like, Jesus, man, I was casting out demons today, all a day in the office, sent some emails, cast out some demons. Like, like that's just not that's not how my, how my days usually go. And so they come back to Jesus and they say, Jesus, we did it. Even demons are subject to your name. We, 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 the authority that you gave us, we used it faithfully, and they're excited about it, and they should be excited about it. And Jesus responds, He said to them. I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing at all will harm you. However, don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you. Wait a minute. This is a big deal. Like, be, like if you're going to kind of rank like superstardom and being varsity versus junior varsity in your discipleship, I think casting out demons is like the very top. Like not like there's not, that's not like, oh man, you just got saved. You, 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 you can't find your way through the Bible. You still have to use a table of contents, but you're casting out demons. Like, I don't think it works that way. And so this level and Jesus is saying, no, 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 don't rejoice in that, but instead rejoice in this, that your names are written in heaven that you are mine, that you belong to me, that you will eternally be secure in your relationship with me. Not that that's not important. Like he said, hey, like you are living out what I've seen, what I came to establish. That is good. But your highest level of joy is not in the results that you're getting. Your highest level of joy is that the fact that you're mine. And so I I, I said this to kind of summarize our idea of discipleship. I'm fearful that we've inverted discipleship. We measure success by how many people we've reached and what, what, what we've achieved only to come to Jesus when things are not working. And that's not what Jesus intended. When I read this text, he says, no, I want you to be with me first and all the other stuff follows. But I think we've, we've kind of gotten good at doing the stuff. 
And so because we're good at it and proficient and we've learned strategies and skills, like we, we can figure out how to reach people and build our platform and, and hear me, I'm not bagging on any of that. Like I think there's faithful ways to use common grace for, to submit it to the glory of God, to achieve the mission of God. Like that's a good thing. But oftentimes that becomes primary and then being with him becomes secondary. So we go to prayer meetings when our life is on fire, not just because we want to be with him. Uh, we, we, we fast and pray because we need the Lord to move heaven and earth because we need that thing to happen as opposed to we want to push everything out of the way so that we can be with him more. And so somehow we've inverted discipleship and put being with him as the result of us doing the stuff not working. I promise you this is going to get easier this morning. So I think that's important for our definition of discipleship because I think there's a danger with, with success. But I also want to wrestle through for this week and with next week, what happens when we fail? Right. Nehemiah chapter eight is going to be helpful to start that conversation. As you turn there, uh, let me just give you a, a brief flyover of the book of Nehemiah and actually Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, they actually used to be one book and then modern translations separated those two out. And so this is the story of exiles about 50 years after they were taken to Babylon coming back home. And it's this, it's this parallel stories of, uh, of this reestablishing and this renewal and this recommitment of the people of God. And so if you want to see a detailed understanding of this, it's actually, uh, the Bible Project has an incredible video that'll help you walk through it. But, but here's what I want you to grasp, that the leaders, Zerubbabel, Ezra, ne- Ezra Nehemiah, that they are building this, this, rebuilding this people, rebuilding the temple, rebuilding their co- commitment to the, the covenant of God and rebuilding the walls of the city. And in doing that, it has this um, weird, unsatisfactory element to it. So Zerubbabel, they, they rebuild the temple. They go in and the first time they built the temple that the spirit of God was so thick that the priests couldn't do their duties. And they ended up having like this kind of this lengthy, like when I say lengthy, you think, oh, it was a two hour worship service, seven days. That's what happened the first time they built the temple. The second time they built the temple, it was done, but they didn't feel the spirit of God in that way. That, that Ezra begins to reinstitute the Torah. That, the text that we're going to see, we're actually going to see that happening. And there's this momentary celebration, but ultimately the people don't end up being faithful to it. They rebuild the walls, but even though they rebuild the walls, Jerusalem isn't what Jerusalem used to be. There's this thing of, that they've, they've reconstructed and they've renewed and they've recommitted, but there doesn't feel like there's full transformation. Or let me say it this way, they're back in the building, but it doesn't feel like it used to be. That, that they back to the place where God had moved before, where they've identified themselves with, that they look like they're back where they used to be, but, all, but it doesn't feel like it used to feel. And then Nehemiah 8 through 10 feels like it's this weird disruption because we've had all this language about rebuilding these walls. And then all of a sudden we stop in the middle of that to have a festival. And so Nehemiah chapter eight, actually chapter seven, verse 73, uh, uh, it kind of gives us a little bit of the setting. And then into chapter eight, it says this. When the seventh month, the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people gathered together at the square in front of the water gate. They asked the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had given Israel. On the first day of the seventh month, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could could listen with understanding. While he was facing the square in front of the water gate, he read out from it from daybreak until noon before the men, the women, and those who could understand. All the people listened attentively to the book of the law. The scribe Ezra stood on a high wooden platform made for this purpose. Mutita, Shama, Aniha, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah stood beside him on his right. To his left stood, stood Padiah, Mishael, Malkiah, Hashem, Hashishbadana, Zechariah, Mishalem. Ezra opened the book in full view of all the people since he was elevated above everyone. As he opened it, all the people stood up. Ezra blessed the Lord the great God, and with their hands uplifted, all the people said, amen, amen. They knelt low and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Jeshua, Benai, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Sherebthai, Hodiai, Mosheah, Kalida, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, 
were, who, who were Levites, explained the law to people as they stood in their places. They read out of the book of the law of God, translating and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was read. Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to all of them, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping as they heard the words of the law. And so this, this section uh, feels a little bit troubling because how are we supposed to feel about this? It actually feels like it's a case in point to the book of Nehemiah, right? Because it feels like this was meant to be this, this moment of we're recommitting, we're back. Like the people asked for this. It says that they all gathered in the square and they said, hey, Ezra, will you come read the law to us? Like there was this excitement for them to hear the law. And as this is happening, as he begins to read, as he begins to see these 13 leaders surrounding him, standing on the platform in this sacred moment of the law being amongst the people of God again. And they're saying, amen, amen. Yes, this is good. This is what we are committed to. As they hear more and more of what they're supposed to be, it becomes more and more evident we ain't that. Uh, it, it's kind of like um, there, there's a, a thing in business called the Peter Principle. And the Peter Principle is that you will advance in your career to the point of your inability. And I just think about that moment. You're applying for jobs, you get jobs, and then one day you get called in your boss's office and they're like, um, you're not doing your job well. Is there, is there, do you not understand the position description? Oh man, no, I got it. Well, let's walk through it together. Can you do X? Oh no, I'm not good at that. Can you do this? No. Do you have this degree? I, I don't even know what that is, right? Like, like, there, like, I can imagine that there's this moment that they're seeing all that they're supposed to be and they're like, we're not that. And so the natural reaction to that is, if this is what I'm supposed to be and I'm not that, this would break my heart too. Like if I'm standing in the place of the holy God on a holy day. In fact, uh, if you uh, wanted to know the timing of this, that we're, this next week we're getting ready to go into Yom Kippur. This festival would have been just a few days, five days after Yom Kippur. It's the festival of tabernacles or the festival of booths. Like this is this moment that there's atonement and then there's celebration. And in the middle of it, they're recognizing we need that atonement more than we realized. That we wanted this moment where the law was going to be read. That we thought we were back and things were going to be the way that they used to be. But we recognized we're in a different zip code, but we're still the same broken people that we once were. Right, right. And in being in that moment, Ezra and Nehemiah are like, hey guys, don't mourn. Don't weep. Which if I'm one of the people in the crowd, I'm like, did you hear what you just read? Because we're not that. And what I know is that when unholy people come near a, a holy God, that this doesn't tend to go well. That for us to be at this, as close as we're supposed to be to his presence, as close as we are to the temple, in the midst of his city, in the midst of his people, like this should actually be a scary proposition for us. So I'm weeping because I'm heartbroken, but I'm also weeping because I'm a little bit nervous. Yeah. And they're like, no, don't weep. This day is holy, which my response is, I know that's the problem. And then they begin to instruct them in what they should do. Nehemiah 8, 10 would say this. Then he said to them, go and eat what is rich, drink what is sweet, and send portions to those who have nothing prepared, since today is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the Levites quieted all the people saying, be still since today is holy, uh, don't grieve. Then all the people begin to eat and drink and send portions and have a great celebration because they had understood the words that were explained to them. And so here what they said, they said, hey, like you should actually be celebrating right now. It says, go eat the food that is rich. What that literally means is uh, take the fatty parts of the meat. And so it's just fat, but at the restaurant, they call it marbling when it's on your, on your steak to make it feel fancy. Like eat those parts too. And for people who aren't prepared to do this, you share the wealth of what you got. You share it with them, which seems to make zero sense because they still haven't dealt with the fact that they haven't lived faithfully. And then Ezra would speak out. Here's why you're going to do this because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, I think we, if you've been around the church, you're familiar enough with that phrase, maybe not in its context, but somebody said it during some setting that you're like, yeah, that, that's a good thing. But can we wrestle with that for a moment? Because I don't know what the Lord's joy does for me when I'm still incapable. 
Like the alternative would actually be more reassuring. That the strength of the Lord would be my joy. In fact, that's just good Old Testament theology. Like when you begin to read through the scriptures and they begin to talk about God, this is what God tells Moses in Exodus 6 when Moses is like, hey, I don't know why you keep sending me in front of Pharaoh. Like I went to him before saying, hey, can we just go into the wilderness and just worship a little bit? And he made things worse for us. And the Lord's response was, do you think that my arm is too short and that my power is not strong enough to save? Like this is the type of language that you read in the Psalms when they begin to talk about the strength of the Lord being able to defeat their enemies, that the arm of the Lord is against their foes and that they would rejoice in that. This is what Elijah's doing when he's calling on the power of God but opposed to his enemies, that he's looking at the glory of the Lord. This is what we see in the New Testament when they're around the throne of the book of Revelation, that they're giving glory and honor and worth and majesty and might to the lamb that was able to slay the thing that was trying to slay them. So it's good theology that the strength of the Lord would be your joy. And of course it would be. Like the Lord being able to do what I can't do, like our theology is built on that. And so how does the joy of the Lord being your strength make any sense? How does the, the Lord having some type of positive affection, how does that mean anything for us? And I just want to, in that moment, think about what's happening in their minds, that we have failed the Lord, we failed his covenant, and Nehemiah and Ezra say, no, you guys should be rejoicing because as much as you failed, the Lord has been faithful to you. That on this day, a holy day, the reason that you should be celebrating is that the Lord's presence is in your midst, that he hasn't backed away from you and said, I'm done with them. That I don't, I don't want to have anything to do with them. And so the, the positive joy, the, 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 the love, the affection, the affirmation of the Lord towards this people is the thing that should strengthen them in their discipleship. And so let me, let, me, let me bring the idea home. You remember back when you were in school and there was that girl or that guy that you just wanted them to be for you. And not like for you, like supportive, like you want that to be your girl or your guy. And just, and remember if you were involved in extracurricular activities. And so for me, I played basketball, I ran track. And I can remember when I would play against other teams because it didn't happen for me, there'd be some guy on the other team who would have like posters from some girl. And my goal in life was to make that dude look bad. I needed therapy early on. Like I wanted to be the villain. <laughs> and you just knew that that dude was going to try and show out. Because like, it could be a girl, it could be his mama. Somebody's got a sign that says, so-and-so, number 34, you're the best. I'm like, not today, homie. <laughs> but all of a sudden, your level of ability goes up when somebody is, is for you in that way. All of a sudden, something in you stirs and says, there's a little bit of extra effort you can give, a little bit of extra skill that you can reach deep and find. And it's, it's brilliant to me that here's what Ezra would say. You have failed the Lord. But what's not going to help you be more faithful is you trying harder. What's going to help you be more faithful is the fact that the Lord deeply loves you, that his covenant affection towards you has not been abated and pulled back, but he's still in it with you. Like, I, I want you to hear that for you. Like even this morning that we, we came in and the Lord was doing something unique during worship, trying to say, hey, I want to break through. I'm here for you. And for some of you, uh, there was a word that was given to me from Jeremiah 2.13 that literally said that you've been unfaithful to the Lord, the living spring of water. And instead you've traded that in for cisterns that can't hold water. So you've substituted the real joy that comes from the Lord for something much lesser. He's saying, and yet I still want to break through for you. Like there's a reality that the, the affection of the Lord, the love of the Lord towards us blows our mind, but it also strengthens our hearts and our hands to be faithful to him. God's covenant affection for his people empowers our obedience. So let's go back to our main idea. Discipleship is not just learning skills or achieving results. Discipleship is centered on being with Jesus. This is where the joy is. And each week we've, we've kind of divided what we're doing into a, an opportunity to discover joy, but then also an opportunity to develop joy. So let's just talk about discovering joy. If there is joy in following Jesus, we cannot let shame keep us from coming near to him. Amen. I just... I want to fight the lie 
that somehow says that if we were better, the Lord would love us more. Like, I just want to fight the lie that at some point, that if you do this well enough, that if you have enough days that you string together, that you wake up early and read your devotional, that the Lord is going to love you more than he does right now. But I just, I just want to remove the lie that somehow says that, that we need to achieve something to be loved. Like you, are, like, you are the most loved by the Lord that you're ever going to be right now. And like, I, I want that to get down into the depth of our being because when we get that, it brings a level of freedom to us. I, they say this, um, they say most people in ministry that some of the reason why they do it is that they've got a daddy wound. And I can remember several years ago, I had this series of nights that I kept waking up in the middle of the night, terrified, having dreams of feeling like I was shaming my father, my my, my literal father. And so that was part of what led to a season of me being in therapy. And so in that season, it just began to uncover some things. And one of the things that it uncovered is when I was eight and my dad got sick, it changed his personality and he just, uh, his love language was sarcasm. I think his love language is sarcasm. and, but when he got sick, it, it changed the way that he interacted. And, and even it, it turned him more inward, made him more quiet. And there were just some ways that I didn't feel my dad's affection. And let me be careful because if I, if I, I don't want to say this the wrong way. My parents were, are fantastic and they were doing the best they could with really hard circumstances. They, they're immigrants. They didn't have grandma and grandpa to drop me off with. But in the middle of that, there were moments when I perceived that if I was doing something else, that my my dad would be more excited about me. And so I'm, I'm sitting in therapy and my counselor looks me in the face and he says, you really think that if you take the ministry that you're leading from 100 people to 200 people, that Jesus is gonna love you more. And so then he pointed me to the book of Zephaniah. Um, that's one of those books that everybody's like, table of contents, where's Zephaniah? (laughs) So the book of Zephaniah, chapter three, um, chapter three, verse 17 is famous. Um, Hillsong wrote a song called Mighty to Save from that verse. But if you've never read it into context, um, it's actually, it's actually a little bit brutal. So Zephaniah 3, uh, just, just hang with me. We're going to read a lot of text for a moment, um, but I promise there's a payoff. And so Zephaniah 3, starting verse 1, would say this, Woe to the city that is rebellious and defiled, the oppressive city. She is not obeyed. She is not accepted discipline. She is not trusted in the Lord. She is not drawn near to her God. The princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are wolves of the night, which leave nothing for the morning. Her prophets are reckless, treacherous men. Her priests profane the sanctuary. They do violence in, they do violence to instruction. The righteous Lord is in her. He does no wrong. He applies his justice morning by morning. He does not fail at dawn. Yet the one who does wrong knows no shame. I've cut off nations. Their corner towers are destroyed. I've laid waste their streets with no one to pass through. Their cities are lie devastated without a person, with, without an inhabitant. I said, you will certainly fear me and accept my corruption, corruption or correction, excuse me. Then her dwelling place would not be cut off based on all that I had allocated to her. However, they became more corrupt in all their actions. Therefore, wait for me. This is the Lord's declaration until the day that I rise up to plunder for my decision to gather the nations to assemble kingdoms in order to pour out my indignation on them. All my burning anger for the whole earth will be consumed by the fire of my jealousy. You feel encouraged this morning? That's a brutal text. Like he literally begins to list all the ways that they've been unfaithful and says, and you're not even ashamed by it. Your leaders are unfaithful. You as a people are unfaithful. I'm amongst you doing justice. I've shown my strength to push back your enemies. And you are, instead of taking my correction, you actually got worse. He says, so now I just like, like I gotta go all in. 
Like I've got to gather kingdoms and nations and I've got to let my anger burn hot so that way that this is all consumed up. Like this is the type of the type of verses that you're like, wait a minute. Uh, hey, I know I invited you to church. I promise my pastor's not normally like this. We don't usually read text like this. So then when you get to verse 14, it gets a little, it feels like, wait a minute. Did we, did the pages get stuck together? Because verse 14, and I'm skipping 11 through, or, or, or uh, 9 through 11, not because of any of the content, but just because of time. Verse 14 would say, sing for joy, daughter of Zion. Shout loudly, Israel. Be glad and celebrate with all of your heart, daughter Jerusalem. What? <laughs> you just said you're about to set it all on fire. <laughs> like, like. I think I'm part of that. Like you were talking about Jerusalem when you were talking about all the wickedness and corruption and deceit. Like why all of a sudden are we singing? Now what happens in those verses intermediate is like, here's how I'm going to fix this. I'm going to re remove the arrogant. I'm going to re remove those that self-exalt. I'm going to leave a remnant. That's what he's telling them that he's going to do. But like his response to that is like now, and you should rejoice. The Lord has removed your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord, is among you. You need no longer to fear him. Like, like hear that language and remember the book of Nehemiah in this moment that in their despair for what they had done, that the promise of the Lord being amongst them on a holy day, that he's not backing off and running away, that he's running towards them. And then he says, on that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, do not fear Zion, do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is among you, a warrior who saves. But hear this, he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you in his love. He will delight over you with this singing. The, the CSB doesn't do it well. The ESV says that he will sing loudly over you. Like it's not just that, hey, the Lord has redeemed you, therefore no longer be sad. It's that the Lord himself is celebrating that he's with you. That the Lord himself is rejoicing about you. That the Lord himself is quieting you with his love. That the Lord himself is sitting on the throne singing. Like when was the last time that you were just, mm, I bet the Lord right now is singing over me. So when, when Apollo was really little, uh, to entertain him, because you had to figure out how to entertain a toddler before they destroy your house. I would just sing songs over him. And not like real songs, like I would just make up songs about him. And so I, I, would, I would say, there is a little boy who likes to run and jump and laugh and make a mess. A-P-O-L-L-O-J-A-M-E-S, Apollo James, Apollo James. Like, had a whole thing. Now the problem is, he would get super excited and tear up the house more when I sang that. And some of you are like, wait a minute, did you steal, did you steal the Mickey Mouse song? I sure did. Mickey, come get it, right? Like, I, like I ain't, I'm not afraid. <laughs> and you probably don't think, oh, I bet Matt, Mike's at home right now, singing over his kid. <laughs> but what if we could dial into the reality that that's the affection of the Lord for you? That even when you're making a mess of your life, that be, if you have trusted Jesus and you're his, that while you're working that through and learning how to be a faithful follower of Jesus, that he's not sitting back saying, my anger burns hot against you and I want to destroy you, but instead that he's rejoicing over you. Yeah. That he's saying that I am yours and you are mine. And he, he's not like whispering it like, they're mine. Like, like loudly singing over you. Like what if his affection is being poured out in that way? And what would that do for you? Like if you knew that the Lord was in on you in that way, that his affection was poured out towards you in that way, think of the freedom that it would give you. Hallelujah. Think about the way that you would read your Bible, that it would be different, that it wouldn't be, well, they told me that I gotta read 1 Corinthians 15, there's 55 verses to this thing this week. Like why couldn't he pick like, why couldn't he pick Luke 24? It's one verse, two words, Jesus wept to be awesome. I think it's John, it's John 11, I think. But like, what if, you knew that the Lord was rejoicing over you. And in him rejoicing over you that you felt like he was going to meet you there. That he had something that he wanted to say to you that morning. That something that was written long before you were born. That he was wanted to speak directly to you out of that. Yes. 
Like think about the way that it would lift shame off of you if you knew the Lord's like, man, I know everything about you and I'm still singing over you. Some of you may have struggled writing your testimony because writing your testimony made you have to go back, at least in your mind, to the places that you had been. But what if knowing that about yourself and the Lord knowing that about you, he'd still say, hey, you're still mine. I ain't changing the verse for that song. You're still mine. Like, think of what that does for your disciples. Think about what you, how you pray if you know the Lord's attentive and he's like, I'm here and I've been here. Think about the way that you serve. Think about the way that you would share your faith with others. Think about the way that you would do community that you don't just kind of sit through group trying to hide or not show up at group at all because you don't want people to know your stuff, but instead that you're like, hey, the Lord is still for me even in the middle of this and he's now given me this family and this community of people to be with me in the middle of it. He is bringing us together despite our shame. What if that was real for us? And so I just, I want to invite you to not let shame be the thing that pushes you away from trusting Jesus. And let me take it a step further. Do not let pragmatism be the thief of your joy. Here's what that means. Pragmatism is that something is good because of the results that it gets. Just because you're not seeing the results today of being faithful and you feel weak and not strengthened. This is why he would say to them, hey, don't let your hands be weak, Zion, because I'm doing something. It might take some time, but I'm doing something. What if that became so real down in the pit of our souls? How he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to experience joy because I get to be with you. And all the other stuff gets to flow from that. So here's how we're going to develop joy this week. This week, I want to invite you to read John 15, 1 through 17. In fact, I want to take it a step further. I want to, I want to challenge you to attempt to memorize verses 15 and 16. And some of you are like, do you know what my memory is like? like? I can't remember my grocery list, much less like memorize scripture. Then do what you do with your grocery list. Write it, on a, write it on a post-it note. Put it in a note in your phone. And what I want you to do is this week, when you step into moments where you feel inadequate and shameful, to remind yourself. Here's what John 15 and 16 would say. You're no longer my servants because a servant doesn't know what the master's doing. Instead, I've chosen to call you friend. You didn't choose me. I chose you. Like, hear Jesus saying, like, I didn't draft you because you were good. Like, and you're also not here just because I need you to get stuff done. Like, that's not why I called you. I I called you because I want you to be my friend. I want to have a relationship with you. I want you to know the joy that has always existed in the triune God and the relationship that we have with one another. I want to invite you into that to know that and live in that and let that fuel the way that you live. This is how joy fuels our discipleship that we recognize that discipleship is centered on being with Jesus. And even in your brokenness, he's not backing away and saying, hey, that's too much, I'm done with you. He's still singing that you are mine. Let's pray together. So Jesus, for my own soul, I long to, to know in the very depth of who I am whether I can perform or not, that you love me. That if I stand like Israel did on that day when Ezra was reading the law, and as we go down the list, I, I, I don't get a passing mark on any of it. That I would know that your covenant affection for me is not based on the fact that I've done well, but it's based on that you are good and that you will fulfill your covenant even when I fail it. And therefore, your joy of being with me is the strength that I need to to continue to try and follow after you faithfully. Now, 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 Lord, I recognize there's another side to the coin and and we'll deal with that next week that I don't just stay in my brokenness. I don't just stay in my sin. There's a a turning around. There's a repentance and and repentance is a pathway to joy. I know that that sentence doesn't make sense in our minds, but but Lord, you you, you show us that in your word through, through David's confession before you. But today, I don't, I don't think that we're people of repentance if we don't know that there's a God that's willing to forgive. It's a, if we don't know that there's a God that's mighty to save, that is rejoicing over us, that wants to quiet us with his love, and that wants to sing loudly about us. 
And so, Lord, I pray today, would you, would you spark that flame down in the depth of the spirit of your people? Would they see and know that you are not backing away from them, but their discipleship is built, centered on being with you first. And when that happens, it strengthens and fuels everything else. Would the joy of your covenant affection be their strength? It's in your matchless name I pray. Amen. Amen. Again, thanks for watching this message online. And here's our hope, that you didn't just hear the word of God, but that it compels you to follow the way of Jesus. Here's what we mean by that. We're not just giving you information, but we believe that there's steps that you take afterwards to obey Jesus, to serve the world around you, to give sacrificially, and to go to others who haven't heard the message. And so one, we would love to know you, particularly if you're in the Southern California area. If you go to kingsharbor.org slash hello, you can send us a digital connect card, and we would love to follow up with you, just get to know you better. We also hope that you didn't just hear a message and then just stow it away somewhere, but it compels you to obey and follow the way of Jesus. Uh, We pray that you do that in community. That's the best way to live this out. You can live it out. We just don't believe you should live it out alone. Uh, On top of that, we we believe that this is an opportunity to serve. And whether that's you serving uh, the church or the community around you, that those who follow Jesus reflect Jesus by the way that they serve. Then we would ask that you give. Giving is not something that is uh, just kind of a tradition in the church. It's evidence that you fully trust Jesus in every dimension of your life. And then finally, we're praying that you go, that you would share this with someone else, that if the Lord has impacted you by his word to see Jesus better and love him more deeply, that you'd invite others to do the same by either sharing this message with them or entering into community with them and sharing what the Lord has done. So we're excited to hear from you, to connect with you, and to hear about what the Lord's doing through his word and in your life.